Welcome. That was turned up very loud for me. So now I'm really amped up and my heart is pumping. Really glad to have you all here. Thank you for joining us for episode 10 of Structure Series, Leading Change. We took a little break in November and we're back uh, here in December to wrap up our 10 episodes for 2021 of our online series for structure. We have a lot on the docket for 2022. There's a lot of things coming, a lot of plans being made. Um, but for now, we're going to have a great conversation and get ready for the holidays. So thank you for coming. Please, uh, you know, in the chat, I can see some of you here. Please let us know where you're from. Where are you, uh, where are you attending from and, and connect with us here? This is an interactive session. So most of you, uh, I think a lot of you have been here before. There's some new people, but um, turn on your chat bar to the right, add some comments, connections, talk to people, however you like. At the end, you want to hit those last those little three dots at the bottom right to save the chat so you can save any of that information and emails, anything you want to do to help people connect with you or connect with the speakers you can put there. If you have any specific questions for our speakers, reach down and look at the Q&A button. That is where the official questions go. We'll be looking at that throughout the conversation so you can join us there and we can add that in. And at the end, we'll have information to subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch this in about a week. This will be up for you to see again. Thank you to Karen Dunn and the KMD Pro team for running these events smoothly and Dan Bones for the opening animation, Greg Brace for the original music score and intro music and all of you for being here. I want to start out by thanking our sponsor, uh, Cordura Advanced Fabrics. These guys have uh, been with us from the get-go since Structure started and continue to be an amazing support. I'm going to read a little message from them. Um, they've been celebrating their decade of durable denim, a, a materials uh, supplier for all all kinds of industries. Um, for about 10 years now, Cordura has been collaborating with designers and brands to explore, engineer, and encourage everyone in the denim world to think differently about what they create. Because as we all know, those things that we create now need to do more than ever. And that's truly what makes Cordura denim special. It's got cult hero status with all types of consumers all over the world because it does. It lasts and lasts and lasts. And that's a sustainable story that I really believe in myself. So now as Cordura continues to build on 50 years in the fiber and fabric business, they continue to innovate, helping us in the design community, bring our own ideas to life. And we are excited to continue working with them and thrilled with their continued support of structure. Thank you guys. And so today I am really excited to talk with four women from the industries of music and design. These women are leaders all in their own right, whether leading a company, a department, people, or a process. They're all leading also a creative vision. Their age range spans three decades, experience spans more than four. Today, we're going to talk about what it means to be a leader, how leadership is evolving in these rapidly changing and increasingly important creative industries. So I want to welcome to the screen, Zoe, Martina, Shaney, and J. Lou. Come on and join us. Hi, everyone. Hi, y'all. Hi. How are you? Doing great. How are you guys doing? Glad everyone could join us. Everyone can say hi to test your speakers, too. Hello. Hi, good morning. Hello. All. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you had to break the ice to get everybody to just cut through that piece. Uh, so welcome. Thank you all for being here. And I, I was looking at my uh, my 10 episodes that we did for the year. I mean, this year has been experimental where we allowed ourselves each month to just do whatever we wanted to try and do and, 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 and test to, to really work on bringing the design and music worlds together. And I was looking at, um, we started with, I think, three guests, three guests, then went to two, 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 two for many episodes. 
Then the last one we did one. And all of a sudden I was like, four, I want four people. <laughs> and, and it just blew out. Like, and, um, and, and so I'm really excited to have you all. And I'm glad you can make time in your busy day um, and all the people watching as well. So wonderful to start. I want to start out with a little bit of an intro from each of you. Um, Martina, I want to start with you. Uh, I want to hear, you know, who you are, what you do, and um, what, what in your world um, do you have to be a leader in? Hmm. Thanks, Michelle. My name is Martina Brimmer. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling in from Seattle, Washington. Um, and I run Swift Industries. We're a bicycle bag company here in Seattle, Washington. Um, and my husband and I, we founded the company uh, in 2008 in our basement with a roll of fabric and a sewing machine. Nice. And, <laughs> um, and now we are in a very different place. Today I'm signing in from a partial manufacturing and warehouse space, and then an office in marketing and design space. And we've got a team of like 16 of the most amazing people uh, that I get to collaborate with and work with every single day. Mm. Um, so I'm really the strategic lead, the visionary here at Swift Industries. And uh, I hope that I am a mentor to all 16 folks that mm. work in my company. Mm. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. How about you, Zoe? I want to hear from you. Give us a little intro. Uh, thank you, first Michelle and Karen, for inviting me. Uh, I'm Zoe Thrall. I'm the director of studio operations at The Hideout Studio in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, from a young age, uh, I was a musician. I would pick up any instrument I could get my hands on. And in college, got exposed to the audio industry and got smitten um, and took off from there. <laughs> uh, my career, which I'm the oldest one here, <laughs> does span decades. I, was the one that she I think I'm right behind about. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it, it, everything from performing live in a band to engineering, and then over those years, honing my management skills. So I went from being you know, in front of the glass, as we say in the recording mm -hmm. industry, to behind the glass. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, managed recording studios, large recording studios in New York City, uh, the Hip Factory and Power Station, where I was supervising over 75 employees at, at one time. Wow. Now in Las Vegas, I've been here 16 years, the studios are smaller, you know, uh, even though it's only even though it's only <laughs> 10 people. Um, You're in demand. I, I uh, I, uh, um, um, you know, it still takes a lot, uh, every ounce of energy, 24 hours a day to, uh, yeah. to uh, manage the uh, studio. So thank you again for having me. Hey, thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, business is going on. It happens. Um, uh, Jay Lou, tell us a little bit about you, please. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Jay Lou. Uh, you, she, her pronouns. Um, my background is in industrial design, and these days uh, I kind of apply that lens to design research and service design programs at Evolve Collaborative, uh, an insights and design agency in Portland, Oregon, where I'm based. Um, we're small, a team of 12. Uh, I feel what you're saying, Zoe. Um, and our projects span product and digital design, insights and innovation, um, branding and strategy for companies big and small uh, across industries from healthcare to banking to active lifestyle. And so um, that's really fun for me because every day is so different. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Ohio uh, and I went to the University of Cincinnati, uh, which has an amazing design program. Um, they have internships built into their curriculum. Um, and so by the time I graduated, I had done five internships, um, also at companies big and small um, and, and across industries too. And so my last internship was with Evolve, which was how I ended up out here. Um, and I think about leadership in my role more in terms of mentoring and working with our interns and um, students, both in university and, and in high school when I get the chance. Um, through my journey, I've been so lucky to be surrounded by such incredible leaders who really supported my growth and pushed and challenged me in different ways. Uh, and I continue to be surrounded by a lot of amazing leaders. And so uh, I think the question that I always think about is how can I model that for others? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. And you also play music a little bit too. 
a little bit. <laughs> I'm always dabbling. I'm always pulling that out of people too. There's a lot of connection between, you know, art and music. Uh, you know, people usually often do a combination of both in some way, whether they know it or not. So, and the Evolve collab team has been great. We've had uh, some of our events over there as well. So you do work with an awesome team. Yeah, they're, and they're great to have you. So Shaney, give us an intro to you. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Um, I'm Shaney Rhodes. I'm from San Diego, and that's where I'm calling in from today. Mm. Uh, I'm a musician and a small business owner. My business is a music school in San Diego, and we teach private lessons. We started out playing, or excuse me, teaching just guitar and then ukulele. And in the last two years, I've we've grown quite a bit, and now we teach drums, voice, what else? Oh, and piano, basically all the popular mm -hmm. instruments. So um, that's really exciting. We're expanding into a new office in the new year. So mm -hmm. I do that full time and I'm also a musician full time. So I have two full time jobs. Um, <laughs> I write, record, perform. So I do all that when I find the time to when I'm not running my business. <laughs> Two full-time jobs and no other life. Huh? <laughs> and my life, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. And I have to say, I first met Shaney too um, when I decided to kind of dig back into music several years ago. And I'd already been running Structure, but music was a big part of my life growing up. My father was a musician. Everybody around me was a musician. And um, I decided after my son got hit a certain age, I was like, I want to learn guitar. He didn't want to learn guitar yet. He was about to turn six. And I said, I want to learn guitar. I've always wanted to learn guitar. I knew voice. And I decided I wanted a guitar and lessons that year. That was all I wanted. And I ended up over at Guitar Center near my house. And Shaney was managing the lessons, the, you know, the, the whole studio there. And that's how I met her. because She was really running all the different instructors as well and, and uh, got to know her over the years and see her live as well. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to ask you guys all, I want to start with you, Zoe, since you are the, <laughs> the, the lead leader here, is, um, what is what does leading mean to you? What is leadership or being a leader? What does that mean to you? I'm, it's an open question I'm going to ask all of you, but what does that mean to you? I mean, it's been said before, but I can't stress it enough. Um, First and foremost, you set the example for others to follow. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, being a good listener and keeping an open mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all come from different backgrounds. Um, you have to be open to new ideas if you're going to be a true leader. And uh, you have to be conscious of that. Um, yeah. Encouraging personal development in others. Mm. That's the only yeah. way I think that a company can truly grow. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Again, everyone has unique um, um, strengths and weaknesses, and be try to um, to recognize those. Mm -hmm. Have an open dialogue with your employees. Um, handle situations ethically. <laughs> Just, all you have is your reputation, and that's all you yeah. can carry through life. I feel really strongly about that. And um, having a good long term vision for your company. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Being able to see out in front what other people can't see. Yep. So, and that's also something I talk about with um, creatives is, is um, people ask me why I run structure and I'll say, well, because in my experience, people, creative designers, musicians, artists of any sort, they see things people don't see. They, they can, they have a vision, they can see ahead. And that, that strikes me also the same as leadership. Being able to kind of, you know, see out in the jungle and, and there's no path, but you've got to kind of look for something and machete your way through it is always what I say, you know. So it seems very similar, you know, that, cre that you've got to be a creative thinker in a lot of ways. So, yeah. How about you, J. Lou? Yeah, actually. From your perspective. Uh, yeah, you hit on all of the things that I was thinking too, Zoe. I think sometimes um, 
leadership has the the connotation of being in the forefront and being the loudest and the biggest and I think truly the qualities of a leader that really resonate with me is in the ways that they support the people around them and, and how do they you know act as act as an advocate for others and so oftentimes when uh, we're working with interns as mentors um, you know we we are focused on giving them the best experience it's not about you know what can they necessarily do for our company. Um, it's really about what what can we teach them and what can they learn from us and what can we learn from them too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, going both ways. Yeah. How about you, Shaney? I mean, you're in a you're in a position there too, you know, both as a performer, you know, where that's kind of like that being that visual and that loud and that one there, but then also, you know, leading a school where you have other teachers, you've got lots of students. What does leadership mean for you in those two roles? I, to me, a leader is someone who, you know, really takes charge and they, they don't wait for the things they want. They go out and get them. So, um, you know, like an example would be that I like to wake up early and like go do the things that I have to do because, you know, I can't wait for them to happen. So that's one thing. And I just think that, um, you know, a leader is also like a role model and a mentor, like, uh, you guys have mentioned, and it's someone that others can look up to, mm -hmm. like my students that look up to, mm -hmm. to me and my, um, the other teachers, we're all role models to them, or we have to be cognizant of that. We have to set the, uh, the standard and the example for them. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? I'm, I'm, I think I drowned out your last thing. What did you say? I think that's what a leader is. Yeah. Even through the difficult stuff, right? Because there's always Especially. <laughs> yeah, I like, really believe that. That's what I was going to chime in with. I think. Okay. Yeah. Let us know. Tell us. What do you think? Yeah. Um. I mean, I think every I I would amplify everything that everyone has said, and I think when I like when I have wind wind under my wings as a leader is when everything is like real good, of course, mm -hmm. and you're just like this is like one of the most empowering spaces to be in, and where. I can feel the most overwhelmed and the responsibility, the true responsibility of this role is when it's about uh, really, really high pressure, really high mm -hmm. tension. Mm -hmm. And and you're like in a scary space as entrepreneurs of, a, yeah. of companies, of endeavors. Um, I think we maybe generally speaking have a tendency to push into the unknown and test our boundaries. and um, I think that one of the leadership skills is modeling how to sit with a certain calm and attentiveness and awareness yep. in very, very tense spaces. Yeah, that's um, really good. Yeah, yeah, that's that is like I think the one of my lifelong lessons for sure. Yeah, I have to say one of the biggest things I learned from a leader who was my boss and my martial arts teacher e eons ago was watching her go through of a really challenging situation for her and her business and being challenged by a bunch of, 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 of challenging situations and just seeing how like literally, you know, just watching, how is she dealing with this? Oh my God, that's completely opposite of what I would have thought. And, um, it, it stuck with me, you know, that, that example, um, what's an example, um, Shani, let's start with you. Who, who what's a, who, what was your first experience or awareness of a leader in your life? Like a mentor, it could be family, school, somebody in the media, work. What do you remember as kind of being a first awareness of somebody that you either looked up to or you saw as that leadership role? My grandmother. She, oh. um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, was <laughs> she was an elementary school teacher. And in fact, before I was even old enough to go to school, I have memories of going with her to work sometimes, you know, when she was watching me. Yeah. And I just thought it was so cool how she transformed from this person who was my grandmother to this person that had command of the classroom, but she was also, you know, their friend and she spoke two languages. So it was a bilingual class. It was English and Spanish. So that was pretty cool to see too. I don't speak any Spanish. I never learned it, but I remember also being like awestricken by them speaking another language to one another. And I was just kind of like, 
on the outside looking in, but I, I really looked up to her and I have a lot of memories of her um, in that fashion. And then she retired. So mm, that's, that's so one of my first experiences and my karate <laughs> teacher who I didn't listen to, but <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's speaking for just having seen you teach and whatnot. And, and with, with, you know, with some of the kids, it, it, I, I can see it speaks volumes to that. So awesome. How about you, Martina? It was an early, I'm actually having a hard time pinpointing any single individual. There, I mean, there were so many influential people. Um, I will say later um, in college, I had one professor who um, I think that he was just so hungry to learn and so excited to watch his students learn mm. that I just showed up every day, like so excited to engage. Mm-hmm. And like, if I could bring that to an environment, that would just be like the apex, right? Just mm-hmm. like keep learning and keep like really cultivating that for the people in your team. Yeah, that infectious enthusiasm. It's so cool. I think you bring that. Yeah. <laughs> you do. <laughs> you know, and there is that thing that where they say that, like, you know, smiling is infectious. You know, that attitude when somebody's in that mood, it it, it brings everybody up, and so mm-hmm. and it makes you want to show up. Um, yeah. How about you, J. Lou? Uh, yeah, it has to be my mom. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, she was the ultimate leader and like the ultimate superhero. Um, she raised me and my twin sister as a single mother um, and, you know, was working full time. And I think that at the same time, you know, balancing everything and keeping her cool, Martina, like you were talking about, you know, in the face of these these really big challenges. Um, and then all of those other qualities, too, of, of letting me and my sister have our independence, you know, the freedom to make our own mistakes and learn from them. Um, and she doesn't sugarcoat anything. She gives it to you straight and she'll rightfully call me out when it's needed. And I think, you know, you look for that in a leader. <laughs> so Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. 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 Honesty and trust, trusting that trust mm-hmm. is important. Oh, so cool. How about you, Zoe? Uh, I would also say it's a family member. My stepmother, Anna, who was an immigrant to this country, uh, didn't uh, know English when she came here. Uh, learned English, started her own business, worked really hard, still to this day is working at the age of 85 because she says, what do I do? If I don't work anymore, I die. <laughs> you know, so she, she's so awesome. And she just instilled that ethic of hard work in me. And again, setting the example. And so I owe her enormously. Yeah, yeah. We really look to the... the everybody uh it's not all women i think your teacher was not not was a male teacher martina mm-hmm. yeah, yeah in this case mm-hmm. yeah and I, i'm not to pinpoint it can be anybody i've had really great ones on all sides but yeah my mom was really um that first one for me as well you know and so the 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 power of that family you know having a strong somebody in your family or your school or your life um, it is so important. Um, but there's so many different ways. I mean, we could dig into that and really talk about all the different ways that people have been leaders. I mean, I've, I've had a couple of really horrible bosses that I learned so much from, right? You know, those other <laughs> yeah. examples, do you guys have any of those where you have that, that type of thing where you're like, that is not how I want to be, but boy, did I really learn a lot and you remember it, right? So so they, they come in all sizes, but uh, <laughs> anyway, oh boy. Um, I want to talk a little bit and kind of shift from, um, you know, continuing the conversation of leadership, but I want to talk a little bit about the industries because we're putting together in structure, which started out really heavily in the design industry, which was all over, whether it be apparel, industrial, graphic, any kind of design, really. Um, and music was always a bit of a part of it. We've always had some guests that would come in and, and be musical, including, including having a, a Zoe Keating come and play at the end of one of our shows, which was really inspiring for a lot of people and talk about her process. Um, I started to really see as I brought music back into my life, uh, design and music are two things that are incredibly important to me. So they're my passions. That's why I bring them together. But I also see these similarities in the creative process, in the industries, in the struggles 
that the creatives on, um, on both sides have, which kind of spans a lot of creative industries. And I want to talk a little bit about um, the industries that you're in, because two of you are from the design industry and two of you are from the music industry. Um, I want to talk about the differences and similarities that maybe you see, um, but also like what's going on in each of these industries right now. How are they leading? How are they lagging with all the changes that are happening? And anybody can jump in here, um, but really want to just really talk about what your industry is like and um, music, design, any of it. But we can start, maybe Jay Lou, I'm gonna pick on you actually. <laughs> <laughs> now you're, you're the, you're, and you're probably the youngest here. I'm just, I don't know, but, um, but you know, kind of the newest into the industry. And so I do kind of want to start with you with your perspective of coming in and you don't have as much history or baggage behind you of, of it. Um, and you have a fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. I always think, I, I always say as a leader myself, I look to the younger ones and say, I need that fresh perspective because I don't have it anymore. And you always need to know how does it look for the next <laughs> people coming up? What ideas do you have? But that's what critical, it, Michelle, what you said right there, that yeah. keeping the open mind, you know, yeah. fresh yeah. ideas. So yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that. absolutely. I mean, we yeah. as, we as, um, you know, maybe the more seasoned people, we don't have all the answers. Yep. We have a certain level of experience, which also creates some blinders to some of the new things that younger people have. And I have to say my 10 year old son teaches me a lot about that right, <laughs> right now, especially when it comes to video games. Anyway, yeah, Jay Lou, what, um, what's, what's the industry like to you right now? Sure, yeah, um, I was thinking about this question um, and I think so much of the work that we do at Evolve because we are an agency um, is in service to clients and in service to the people that um, our clients are in service to, right? Um, and so one of the things that I've that you know I've been noticing is that the consumer expectations are rising, especially around you know things like environmental sustainability um, and social responsibility. Uh, and so I think we're seeing a lot of companies and our clients step up in those spaces and ask for, ask for things um, in those spaces. Um, I think the question for me is, as I look at that, is which companies are really doing that work versus just doing the, the performative marketing or um, you know, just trying to keep up with the trend. Um, and so I don't know if that's something that you all see also in the music industry from that kind of, you know, more of a, a values led um, perspective. I'm curious, I'm going to ask you guys that on the music side, and um, because the design side right now, I mean, design is really hot. It's a very, it, it's an industry that has really kind of taken off. And I, I've got a chart now of over 30 different design jobs, disciplines specific that are very, you know, it, it's really blown out. Um, and that's a newer thing. So design's very on the forefront. Music's going, has been going through a major transformation forever, right? But um, it has been struggling a lot um, and shifting and changing. What do you guys see um, in this on your side? I mean, it, I don't know about you, Shaney, but I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't see progress in the music industry, certainly on those social fronts that um, J. Lou was mentioning, mm -hmm. you know, the environment, uh, et cetera. And, um, you know, we need to step up and be more of a force in those areas, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless, Shaney, I mean, can you think of any specific programs or uh, the industry has uh, put forth? Well, I think the music industry has been a bit more forgiving to independent artists like myself. I can't speak for, you know, the big record labels and um, right. the big like a &R companies, but for speaking from an independent artist's perspective, um, it's certainly been easier to access an audience and get your music heard with things like social media and streaming platforms. And I think the artist still struggles the most in the industry, like that hasn't changed, but I think it has gotten a little easier, like I said, to, to get an audience and get your music heard because before you needed to have a record label to publish and distribute your music, or I guess have a publisher and a record label to get your music heard. But now someone like me, I mean, you still have to pay a price, but um, you can just, you know, record your music and upload it onto a distribution platform 
And then you can stream it all over the world from there, like on Spotify and Apple music and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I agree with that. I agree with that. The, uh, it, it's much more on the music industry is much more entrepreneurial now, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. much more on equal footing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the mm-hmm. technology also lends, lends to that philosophy because you can, you know, the, the software that we have available to us is available to everyone. Right. And it's, right. Uh, it encourages creativity. And I, th- I think it's fantastic that mm-hmm. those tools are available to anyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like social media is a powerful tool for an independent artist. I mean, you can do all your marketing, promote a show, promote a single or an album you're going to drop just through a screen, like on Instagram mm-hmm. or something. It requires um, the artist to be something more than they used to have to be, necess- maybe yeah. like more business like. Yeah, you, you know, could say that. You know, and because not everybody, I think I've seen a lot of artists on the music side who don't know how to do that and, and struggle with that piece. Um, and, and I think there's similar in design if you're working, especially independently um, as a freelance designer, which is another independent artist, which I've spent time with. And we have a lot of our audiences that as well is um, they're used to finding work with companies and now they have to promote themselves a lot more. And the older Mm -hmm. folks tend to have a challenge in how do I do that? Where the the next level generations are just zooming right along doing what you're doing, Shaney, you know, and um, are a little bit more used to having to have an identity and a personal brand. And access to information too. Yes, yes. Oh, how do I... Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and just coming up with the brand idea, you know. Um, and so there's a couple of directions I wanted to talk about this with. One was the entrepreneurship, which I kind of wanted to lead over to Martina. Uh, but beforehand, I wanted to kind of touch on what Zoe was saying there also in the um, kind of that social, like, uh, you know, to Jay Lou's thing, to the social responsibility and sustainability piece. I wanted to address that first in um, the music side. Cause I, I remember I was talking with um, some folks in the music industry and I was like, what does sustainability do even mean in the music industry? Because in the design industry with products, you're talking about sustainable processes and materials and, and things. In the music industry, you're talking about, there's still things, right? But, um, but yeah, what is, where's the social responsibility and all of that? That felt like it was lacking a bit for me in some of the conversations too. Like it hasn't hit the industry as being necessary. Would you say that? It's obvious, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. But sustainability to me is like, it's a thread that goes from the past into the present and then mm. goes into the future. You know, Mm -hmm, and you have mm -hmm. to be kind of aware of all of that, I think, to make any progress. I was going to ask you guys, yes, this that question at the end, a little bit about sustainability, but it came up sooner. And part of it to me for the artist was also sustainability in being able to sustain a business, a life as an Mm -hmm. artist. You know, that to me is a big one of taking care of your people. Yeah. And I have a lot of, you know, uh, one of the things I was thinking a lot about are things like Bandcamp and Spotify and their different business models, you know, and which one's more sustainable for the business and which one's more sustainable for the people or the artists. And they've always been a bit in conflict, even with any companies. So, so what do you think, Martina? <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a hard one, Martina. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh. You want to go, go there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to lead it over to you for the entrepreneurship thing too, you know? So oh yeah. My what, gosh. yeah. Well, where do we start then? <laughs> <laughs> well, what I wanted to think about was, you know, this leads me to a conversation we've had before when you were on the podcast of, of being able to start your business in the basement, like you did. Mm-hmm. Now I did the uh-huh. same kind of thing, you know, when I was in my twenties, which was in the nineties, uh, it tells you my age and, um, Mm -hmm. And I had a sewing machine in the basement and I was making all my own clothes and I, um, I was making bags and I trying to sell them to yoga studios and I did and it was hard and I put it all away and went back to school got my degree and started working in the corporate design realm, but 10, 12 years later, you did exactly the same thing only you were like, 
oh, I have a sewing machine. I can make bags. Oh, I just make a website and throw up a PayPal button and I can sell my bags. And I was like Mm -hmm. 10 years prior when I did that, those things didn't exist. So I couldn't (laughs) do it. I had to walk into an older person's world and try to, you know, please buy my bags and put them in your store. And it was a very different experience, right? I mean, I have never run a business outside of the Instagram era that has like, Instagram was launched about a year and a half after we launched our company. Hmm. And I believe that Instagram is, or I guess I could broaden it to social media, but I will definitely stand by the fact that social, that Instagram is the um, most visible platform for my company, Mm -hmm. Um, that those channels and that visibility is like, uh, I don't know how entrepreneurs did it before. Like it is so crazy um, to even imagine that. Um, And so like hats off, um, communication, expression um, is so much more accessible Mm -hmm. to somebody, to a a generation of company as as, such as mine. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, thank God I don't ever have to print out a fucking paper catalog for my company. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like I, I don't even know what that would mean for Swift Industries today. Like, I mean, we would figure it out, of course, but there's, there's just all kinds of analog things that I'm like, it's like that I never had to interact with or puzzle through, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's an example for myself and I don't, maybe Zoe, you, you feel this way as well, but um, where, you know, I know I've learned from you. I've learned from your generation. I had to learn a lot more about social media and all of these platforms from the people who were younger than me who embraced them first. Right. Um, and so it just, it were dependent on what my job needed. Um, but that's another thing that's changing is jobs roles. And so with these industries, how are, you know, the industry, how are these industries changing or not changing is kind of how we're already uh, talking a little bit there and roles. So I want to talk a little bit about what your experiences are in both of these fields of design and music of, um, you know, how the industry is changing, what you see going on there and, and the roles and jobs and things that are available. How, what do you see happening in those, those realms? And uh, J. Lou, why don't we start with you? Yeah, Uh, that's a good question. I think more and more, um, I think more and more, especially at Evolve, we're looking for cross-disciplinary thinkers. And so, you know, within design, there are so many, uh, so many boxes you can sit in, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, graphic design, product design, digital design, all of these things. And I think more and more, we're interested in people who um, have a, a variety of experiences and bring something different to the table. Um, and as well, I think, uh, you know, I don't know if it's always been this way, but I, I think a lot of the skills within design are transferable. Um, and so I just right. looking at my friends, you know, a lot of people are thinking about, um, shifting what their role is and potentially leaving behind what they, what they, um, studied in school. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think design is a place that is really encouraging for that because it's the, that collision of diverse perspectives that really, um, I think enables collaboration and it enables creative thinking. And, um, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I was going to ask you about was the thought process. It teaches a thought process, mm-hmm. Yes. right? Yes. Right, for that openness. How would you see similarities between what you think you know, that work in design and then as you're teaching yourself banjo or learning how to play, do you, do you ever notice similarities between those two? In, oh yeah, yeah, process? definitely. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Uh, like what? I'm gonna put you on the spot. Yeah, I, I've seen I, some um, too. <laughs> uh, I tell a lot of people I think of myself as a serial hobbyist, and so banjo and <laughs> bouldering and guitar and ukulele, like all, those are just examples of some of those things. I think for me, ultimately, it's about that iterative process and almost like building a resilience within myself to be okay with messing up and making mistakes and not being able to create something perfect um, mm-hmm. through music and, and through, you know, like movement. Um, right. And I think that is totally, it carries over into the work that I do too. I think, especially with the creative process, it's like, you can't just 
turn it on sometimes, right? Like you get stuck in ruts and, and you have to push through uh, what, what we at Evolve call uh, very professionally the shit zone. <laughs> uh, to get to where you make something good. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think that takes resilience. <laughs> Absolutely. How about you, Martina? What do you see in that? Well, I actually wanted to speak to something. Um, I'm curious um, whether our experiences in like, you know, all of our identities make it such like, I am not surrounded by you all when I step into a bank to talk business. I am not like, I'm often the only person who looks <laughs> like me in a space. <laughs> right, right. It's terrible. It's like not okay, right? Um, <laughs> but I'm also curious, like in allowing, one thing that I've struggled with is allowing myself to not come up with perfect into the space with something that is pre-calculated, premeditated and perfect, mm. because I feel like I have to prove myself in that space in a real different way than my like cis white male peers. That's just mm -hmm. like the kind of the truth of it. And I think that the article right. speaks to that, that mm. like, you know, I think the article referenced that um, women leaders often come into the space already prepared in a slightly different way mm -hmm. because, um, you know, limelight, you, like we kind of still have to prove ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Have, how have you experienced that? Does that resonate? Does that not? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm going to bring into you because you're leading into a, a Harvard business review article that I sent um, I don't know if anybody got a chance to look at it, but you know, you did. Um, but I mean, the link, I, I think we're going to post the link here, but it was really um, one, it was a focus on women in, in the women in the business world. Of course, it's about the C-suite because that's usually where they're, they're focusing on is CEOs and whatnot. And um, the piece that I wanted to bring up about that was I wanted to look at, well, where are we at with that? Because I had a panel of women here. I didn't necessarily want to focus heavily on, okay, women and the challenges and where we're at and whatnot. Um, but, you know, thinking about leadership and how these industries are changing and being women in that, we make change happen by having more of us there and being more integrated. And that is what people are working towards right now is a more of an integrated, uh, you know, integration in all of the industries. Um, and so that article, which was, you know, it was talking about the, you know, fortune 500 companies have hit um, an all time high of out of 500 companies, 41 have CEOs of that are women now. So 41 out of 500 is our big number. And that's strides. And it's really, it's not half, which would be 250. Um, but it's 41 now. But one of the things that they did in that study is they said, you know, the, the title of it was our, or the main component was women change the way companies think. And that's what you're getting at here. Women come in with a different perspective, right? That's what you're speaking to. Um, and some of the studies that they have here that I wanted us to comment on um, were in the, in the findings in this article that, you know, of their study. It said companies led by women are generally more profitable, socially responsible, safer, make higher quality products. They are less open to risk, but more open to change. Uh, less focus on tradition and more focus on challenging the status quo. Less mergers and acquisitions or what they call knowledge buying and more research and development, which is knowledge building from the inside, which feels to me very inherent in a lot of, um, you know, yin or feminine quality too. So it makes sense. Um, I just wanted to hear, you know, what you guys think of these, these types of things. Um, and so first off, just, you know, what do you think? Yes. But then digging into the music industry, you know, uh, the design industry, yes, that too, but especially the music industry. What I mean, are your I, thoughts on that? I, I can address this a little bit. And I come from a unique perspective because my previous studio where I was at for 15 years was located in a casino. So think of a casino, a highly uh, structured business, right? And I was considered an executive at the casino, having, having to run a department. So I would be at these weekly meetings where the president of the casino, you know, how are we doing in each department, blah, blah, blah. And I always felt like it was this old boys club, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I think I found in this article touches on this a little bit. Um, the times when women were taking the meetings over, they seemed to be more inclusive of everyone's ideas and so forth. So I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not bashing guys because there were other, there were men that took over the meeting too, right. that were inclusive. But in general, mm -hmm. uh, we need to just get rid of that old boy club in, in, in companies, I think, and women um, uh, recognize that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about you, Shani? What do you see? I think we have this way of just kind of like nurturing and encouraging the people around us. It's just in our nature. And, you know, with my music studio, I think actually most of my team, I think there's like two guys and the rest of the teachers are girls. And, you know, none of our students, it's not like being a guy or girl makes a difference to them. It's just, we have this balance, which I like. Yeah. And, um, you know, the students that do have, you know, the women teachers, I feel like the students just kind of have this, um, this feeling of, yeah, feeling like they're being lifted up and encouraged and nurtured. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe if it was, you know, I have like, for example, I have a student that's, he's 14 and he can only relate to me so much because I've never been a 14 year old boy <laughs> like he is, but I think he finds in me you know a, a different perspective and a different kind of role model in uh his you know in his guitar education okay. I think we just add some balance yeah <laughs> and the balance is the important you know, I grew up, uh, I did 30 years martial arts training and um, balance of male female teacher um, of running the studio. And, you know, yeah, I actually felt like my female teacher was the one who pushed harder on certain things. And the male teacher was a bit more um, nurturing, but he pushed in a different way. They both pushed in very different ways. And I was always really thankful for the balance of that, mm. you know, so um yeah how about you Jay Lou what do you think yeah um I, I actually want to revisit uh Martina when you brought this up I think uh the when I was reading the article I wrote this quote down because it stood out to me too but it's talking about many women need to walk a difficult tightrope it's um overcoming that stereotype of timid timidness mm -hmm. but at the same time the hyper visibility that comes with being the only one of an underrepresented group um and I think that totally resonates. Like for me, that manifests as I think a bit of imposter syndrome uh, throughout my whole career and still feeling, you know, like I am the youngest in the room, but uh, it's often, you know, am I ready for this? But really when I, when I read that quote, um, I think it's important to also acknowledge that um, those challenges compound when we talk about intersectionality, right? Um, as coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, how race and class and gender and neurodiversity and all of these other characteristics intersect with one another and overlap. And so, yes, mm -hmm. gender, uh, you know, male, female is one aspect of that. But I think, um, and absolutely, we should, we should celebrate the, the progress that we have made and continue to make as women in our industries. But I think we also have to use the position that we're in to keep pushing, to do everything that we can to make our industry and our products and our, our spaces is safe and equitable for um, those who continue to to be marginalized. Yeah, yeah. Here, here. Yep. <laughs> right. I have to yeah. say too. I've I've done a lot with my my partner. A lot of talk about may um you know uh, feminine and masculine energy as opposed to male female, and realize you know knowing that we all have a lot. We all have both, um, and it's sometimes that's what we're talking about is having female or yin energy you know, in balance with the masculine, you know, the feminine energy and the masculine, not specifically, you know, specific gender roles, but it's energies and whatnot. My favorite story um, from the North Face that I love in working with the athletes is we would have a lot of male athletes and we had these amazing women athletes. And I was sitting there talking with two of our top women athletes at one of the um, events that we were working on. And, um, they were saying, um, I was asking how that was different for them as women going on these long, you know, month, lo months long, you know, expeditions up 
the mountains with, mm-hmm. with, with these guys. And they were saying, well, what's interesting is um, they can only pack so much because they have to keep everything super light. Martina, you know, you know, from cycling and whatnot. <laughs> so they would say if, if there were all like, if there were three women and, and, you know, three or four guys on the trip, all three of the women would decide, okay, who's going to bring the eye cream, who's going to bring the hand cream and who's going to bring the lip balm so that they could all share it. They only had to carry one thing. So they would plan that out. And they said what was interesting was um, the guys would kind of laugh about that, that they would do that. But then during the trip, one by one, the guys would run into the tent and ask all of them, can I use your hand cream? Can I use your lip balm? And they were so happy that the women had all of this because they brought that nurturing piece. (laughs) So, uh, you know, so anyway, that's one of my favorite stories here, but can I uh, add a little pushback too, though? Yeah, please. <laughs> I, I a little bit. I know where you're going here. Um, yes. Hi, yo. This is Martina. This is real talk. <laughs> Go for so it. I actually just started interviewing career coaches with one very specific question in mind, something that I need to like kind of raise my awareness and articulation of, and that is when to say like, as your boss. And as your female identified boss, I am not here to be your nurturer. And I am not here to be your empath. That you, speaking uh, largely to the men on my team, need to step up to hone those skills because you are capable of it. And not take that, not rest on me. I'm not your mom. I'm not Mm -hmm. like, you know, for for any of all these roles that we come with, I, I see them as strengths, 180%. And also um, there is a clear need for a boundary and for me to be able to establish and identify that boundary because it's not a good relationship either. Mm-hmm. And there's your thing. Yeah. Was that even something that would have been possible 30 years ago, Zoe? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, would somebody would anybody even talk about that <laughs> no absolutely it's a great not. question yeah yeah that, that's part of the change I mean that has happened is you know we just were a different society back then you know and people focused on different things and we all knew different things as a as a human race you know studying anthropology I look at some of those pieces and see we're evolving you know as people you know, across the globe, but culturally too. So, and that's why you're saying like, um, you know, that's just you, that's a leadership skill too, of making space, a clear, clear definition of expectations and boundaries and making mm-hmm. space for personal care and personal growth in people's lives. Cause that's another thing I think has changed in any workspace is uh, support for anybody to have personal growth and care self-care wasn't a big priority I know for my parents in that generation in the 70s and 80s so um but moving into that um I want to talk about these hats not the beautiful hat you're wearing Martina but the two (laughs) hats like I was talking about all of you guys I was looking at all of what you all do and I was thinking like you know you all have two hats like a hybrid leadership um meaning all of you um work in some capacity of uh, creating and managing, which are different processes. Not all creative people are in the roles of managing people and process and, and mentoring and passing down. And not all managers are creating ideas and, and products. It, it's a certain mindset that does both. Um, I want to ask, um, why, do you, why do you do what you do? in these hybrid things. And I want to start with Shaney. Um, you know, why do you do what you do? Why do you love it? Like what, what's, what's important to you in this? Well, music has always given me purpose. And I think I'm really lucky to have found that out at a young age. Not everyone kind of knows what they want to do so young. And it's just always been my way of connecting with the world, with the people around me. It's, how I contribute to society, either by performing or teaching. And it just provides so many um, avenues for me. And I must say the biggest challenge is finding a balance between um, as a musician being the brand or what I call the brand and also selling the brand. Mm -hmm. It goes back to what we were saying about musicians kind of having to be a little more entrepreneurial these days to stay current. Um, And kind of, I think that shares 
similarities with design because it's about the brand, right? So it's an experience. And so I have to like, like be in charge of everything. So like writing the music to selling the music and scheduling the photo shoots and rehearsals and shows right. and everything in between. So like being in charge of hair and makeup and wardrobe and uh, bookkeeping, you know, designing and selling merch, like, yeah. Uh, I have to be in charge of all of that. So I'd say that it's rewarding and it's fulfilling, but it's also pretty hard. <laughs> I love what I do. So it hardly feels like a job most of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's part of my everyday routine. Yeah. I mean, that's, that speaks it right there. When you, I, I love how you said um, you have to be the brand and sell the brand. Um, yeah. you know, or create the products, come up with the big ideas, and then you have to turn around and sell them. And then you have to do all the bookkeeping and all the scheduling. How yeah. is it for you? How is it for you, Zoe, in, in, in your role? Um, you know, because you've done that same thing as a musician and you've toured and you've worked on music, but you've also managed a huge process of the music. How has that been for you? Yeah, I was the creative uh, entity first. And I, it took a while, it took years for those management skills to be learned. And over time and with experience, I did learn that side. Um, you know, again, we go back to having really good mentors. If you have the mentorship issue is so important. Uh, and I feel fortunate that we ha- I had strong mentors mm-hmm. that would encourage me learning that side of the business, learning about publishing, learning about management, uh, record contracts, etc. You know, um, without the mentor, I would never have learned any of that or learned my management skills. Right. So, uh, and the reason I love the industry is I love the process of record making. I love the technology. I love music makers, you know, whether it's the artists, the producers, the engineers, um, all of it. And there's yeah. nothing better than seeing that magic happen and then hearing the final result by this collaborative effort that musicians have it's wonderful it's a lot of work too i mean it's so (laughs) much people don't know i think about them like if you look around and you look at everything in your life whether it's stuff or all the music you listen to and all the stuff you watch it, it all takes so much work and we kind of take it and throw it away pretty easily you well, know. that's one thing I would, you're touching on mm. something. That's one thing I would say to young music makers is there's this perception that, you know, I can just make this beat and put a vocal on it and put it out there. and It's going to be a hit. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't tell you how often I'll get a phone call all the time saying, well, I want to book three hours and I want it to sound like the next Drake record. You know, <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. So there's, I, I spend a lot of my time teaching young people what the real process is and how much you have to commit to all of it, the, the creative side. And then what Shaney and you, Michelle, were saying that also the business side, you have to get the product out there. And that's the part sometimes they don't understand. And I'm yeah. happy to teach them that, you know, it, it, but I think that's the biggest, uh, uh, mis- not misunderstanding, but the biggest uh, uh, thing that they don't get about the industry is, yeah. you know, how much you have to put into creating your own brand. It's the iceberg, you know, like you yep. see the tip, everybody always mm. sees the tip and they don't see all the work sitting below. Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> or how about like learning an instrument, you know, like, like uh, all your students, Shaney, it's just how much work it actually takes to get good at these things, you know, and understand them. Right. So. Yeah. You can really tell who practices and who doesn't just, yeah. From they're playing in, you know, under 30 minutes, you can just tell, you can see it, you can see who really wants it mm-hmm. and who just kind of comes to hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> or or because their parents want them there. Right, yeah. right, <laughs> right, right. Or the idea of it. Yeah. Design wise too, you know, it's like doing the right kind of product, um, you know, and, and, and making the right kind of stuff. People think it's so easy. And then, you know, be able to design a great thing and simply and do not overdo it just like with music too, not overdo it, but have enough of it to be actually be functional and, and proper and, and be something you want, but then also to manufacture it, 
get it made um, and sell it. Yep. Right. Some of the challenges there. Um, Martina, why do you, why do you do it? Why do you do what you do with these hybrid there, roles here? There are like all kinds of layers to this onion, I think. Um, personally, I think I do it because I like building this company for me specifically has like tapped into a real love and endless curiosity about overlapping disciplines mm. and how to um, layer them and blend them and weave them together. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a puzzle that just keeps on giving in the best way. <laughs> um, and then I think um, my company, like I think that it's like magic in the world basically is um, that like I, my experience and what I've witnessed in my peer groups has been that cycling and adventuring by bicycle is, can be like truly cathartic. And it is a really amazing medium for us as a brand to be talking about um, like uh, land, about wilderness, about um, private property, about like mm. colonialism, about like there are just like so many layers that uh, of like conversations we want to be having by way of our company. Yeah, because I'm not sure everybody knows that you guys also lead a lot of rides, big rides. Yeah, and I don't yeah, just manufacture, we, you know. That's right, we do. Yeah, we have a touring agency as well. But even just through our marketing and our marketing engagement, like the topics that I just started to list off are very much the topics that we want to engage mm -hmm. our, our like growing customer communities around. I think that there's like ample opportunity as we are like learning our, you know, uh, collective awareness is growing by leaps and bounds right now mm -hmm. around um, like environmental justice and uh, decolonization of spaces. And all mm -hmm. of these conversations are so wow. fascinating and so right. Yeah. Um, and that like, this company, Swift, by way of making bags, we get to participate in that in a, like a very intriguing and exciting time. Mm. Um, so that's what keeps like literally that's what gets me up in the morning. Mm. Really cool. <laughs> uh, I mean, I didn't even know you were doing all like, but but yeah, those those points of you know even decolonization, all like you know land makes me think of like hip camp. You know, when we were had hip camp on, they were, they do the social camping where you can. It's kind of like Airbnb for you know camping to lease mm. out your space. You know, but uh, they were on, they were part of structure as well at the beginning. Um, how about you, J. Lou? How you know you're working in designing products and whatnot and in that physical and musical space as well. But yeah, why do you do what you do? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, I, uh, so my background is in industrial design, right? Like physical products. And I think when I was in school, I kind of went through this um, uh, crisis where I was like, uh, I'm designing more stuff in this world that's filled with stuff. And so much of it ends up in the landfills or in the digital ether. Yeah. Um, and so for me now, I really love what I do because um, a lot of it starts with design research and, and it truly gives purpose to the, the work that we're doing at Evolve um, because it puts the people that we're designing at the heart of what we're doing. Um, and especially when we're in the design process, you know, making a decision, it gives it gives us the confidence to say, you know, this is the right thing to do because we sat across the kitchen table from, you know, let's say Michelle, uh, and she told me, you know, these are the things I'm really struggling with, and and these are the things that can help her. Um, and and for one example, you know, we do a lot of work in the healthcare space, and one of our past clients, um, in particular, they provided the the lowest cost um, health insurance on the marketplace, and we did a series of programs with them, spending over I think it was over a hundred hours in the field, speaking to um, their members to understand their hopes and their dreams and their challenges, and what kinds of services our client could provide to really make an impact in their lives. Um, and through a lot of those conversations, I could see my mom and all of the challenges that she experienced, you know, with the healthcare system and that, and, yeah. and that feels like such meaningful work to do, you know, um, things that can really uh, improve people's lives. And, you know, in a case like that could potentially save their lives. Uh, yeah. So I think, yeah, that's, that's what keeps me going when I'm on programs like that. 
Yeah. Making an impact in that. I wanted to think that made me think of when you guys were talking about that, the overly stuffed world, we have so much stuff. And then we also have these conversations um, often, you know, with all of my music world here is um, there's so much music. There's so much music. Everybody's putting so much music out. And now you have this big library that you can access almost everything. I mean, I, um, how do we keep operating in these industries with all this stuff and this music? And all this, it's a lot of, we're all, now we're all able to generate content, right? And they're saying that's the biggest thing is like content generator. It's like, we're making stuff, we're generating content. How do we make ourselves heard? How do you guys feel about that? Like, <laughs> it's kind of an open-ended question. Of how do you feel about that? And what do we do? Where do we go? How do we stand out? There's a lot of questions around that. I just want to know some of your feelings around um, the sheer amount of, stuff that's out there to consume and our in our being part of that you know i'll start with any of you you can jump in <laughs> nope <laughs> quality focusing on uh putting on good quality products or music or whatever it is that you put out is is good yeah like quality, I, mean, I, quality. I, I, I feel michelle's frustration in that sometimes it's hard to find there is so much content out there sometimes it's hard to find what's good out there but at the same time I think it's healthy to have it all out there yeah. you know because you never know what you're going to stumble across either yeah yeah mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting point because it's almost not like there's more there might be more at the same time but now we're just aware of it mm -hmm. you know what I mean like before mm -hmm. we couldn't see everything mm -hmm. we didn't know who was doing what in every country at any given time yeah and so it's more like, you know, we're now we're finding our way to how to digest it and find our tribe. Because we talk a lot about this in design, about finding your tribe. And you find that with, you know, music and arts and whatnot is finding your audience, finding your people. And now you can find more of your people across the globe in different ways. So I guess that's that's one way to look at that. So you helped me see that right now. But that's um, that's something that we're all kind of working with right now is just that overall sheer amount of stuff that we're able to take in. So um, as leaders, do you see a difference? Like, what does it mean to, um, I don't know, some of the, what are some of the things you've learned leading as an artist, leading as a creative person, leading as a manager? Are they different? Are they similar? Are there do's and don'ts? Things that you would say, yes, do this, don't do that, or this is different in, in that, you know, creating mindset or a managing mindset? On the creative side, um, don't feel like you have to give input if the inspiration is not coming to you. Mm -hmm. Don't feel like you have to give input if it's not coming. Yeah, just yeah. to speak, just to say something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I ah, love that. I love that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, Shaney? And that goes back to like how I feel about quality, putting out good quality stuff. And I'm going to say it, less is more. I've always been a less is more. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, and, you know, it's some of my students that are getting into songwriting. I tell them, even if it seems ridiculous, just write it down. Doesn't mean you're going to put it out there. Just write it down. And then from there, you can kind of funnel the good stuff and... Mm -hmm. And you can put it out, you know, it's a process, creative process to polish something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. How about you, Martina? Hmm. Well, as a creative, I think that one of the struggles I had um, that I had to kind of like change my mindset on was in that moment when I went from um, making and designing my product to managing and growing a business. And I got really depressed. Um, I knew that I wanted to grow Swift and I was like very hungry for that. And then like, you know, the bookkeeping and the working with lawyers and the distribution channels, like all of that stuff. I was just like, what am I doing? I'm here for these, like this creative entrepreneurial side of things. And then uh, started, I think to what we spoke about earlier, started to really understand design thinking Mm -hmm. um, and started to apply that to the way that I was building my company. And I was like, okay, 
if what my creative endeavor is moving forward is building a company, then I do have the tools for that. And I do have the, um, I, I will be able to find creative rejuvenation in this process. So mm. that, that was a huge lesson for me and a big turning point. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll leave it there. I think that's a big one for a lot of creative people that decide to go into running their own business. And I think it's going to be all about just being that creative when you actually have to do so much of the business and you don't get to do a lot of the creative. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, J. Lou? Uh, yeah, I would say um, a, a do is stay humble, uh, especially in design. I think um, there can be a lot of ego in that. Um, I'm sure there's probably the same in the music industry too. Um, but I think really remembering to, you know, build on collective knowledge and, and focus on collaboration because there's so much more that we can do together, you know, uh, design doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, it comes when you're bringing people together, sitting around the table with, I think, pens and, and post-it notes, you know, that's how it happens for us at Evolve anyway. Right. Um, and bringing that, that mindset of a student, I think, you know, always being open to learning and absorbing and growing and being wrong uh, throughout the process. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The one thing as you were all talking and Martina, it made me think about when you were talking about going in and just being yourself and having to go deal with bankers or whoever and being all that person who looks different. And what you were saying, Zoe and Shaney, too, is also being true to yourself. You know, it's like, don't speak up just to speak up and say something if you don't actually have something. And if you are working through your own process, don't don't also cut out your ideas before you've actually gotten them down and and mm -hmm. looked at them, you know, and, cho and, and and thought about them, as Shaney said. And so that whole idea of uh, as a creative individual, also in these hybrid roles, like you have to really find that balance to be true to yourself and who you are. Uh, that's kind of what I pulled from that. But um, we're kind of running towards the end of our time here. And we only had, I don't know if anybody has any other questions, but there was one and it says, will this, uh, this conversation be available to download in the future, which is a great question. And yes, we will have it on YouTube in a week. So this is being recorded and it will be up. Um, if there's any last words of wisdom, anybody wants to impart or share before we go. Don't forget to have fun. Yes. <laughs> Design should yeah. always Absolutely. have fun. Whatever you're doing should always be fun. It's <laughs> yes, a very that. serious conversation, but don't forget. But along those lines, find something you enjoy. But if you find down the line that that thing, that very thing you thought you wanted to do, you've now come dis become disillusioned with, then it's okay. Don't be afraid to change either. Mm. Mm. Yes. I love I that. that. Yeah. Mm. Especially as I get older too, I've had some changes in my. It, <laughs> Don't it be afraid to happen. change. <laughs> yeah. It will. It will. All right. Thank you all. I want to thank you, Zoe, Martina, Shaney, J. Lou, for being here and spending your your lunch hour and your time with us and with everybody. Um, I have really enjoyed talking with you all and connecting you. You all don't know each other, didn't know each other until we met here. And I love doing that. I love bringing people that I think are awesome and should know each other together at Structure. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for having us. Yeah. absolutely absolutely and keep do keep doing it and um we'll put this up so everybody can keep watching this and getting inspired and thank you everybody for tuning in um and we're going to sign off here and we'll have the um the youtube channel will be posted when we're done here so we will see you all in 2022 for online and in-person events and uh have a great day take care thanks Thanks all. Mm -hmm. Bye.